Boom, and we're live. And we're live. So welcome, everybody. Rob here from NoBS Photo Success, our uh, weekly, bi-weekly uh, photo buzz with uh, John Butler and yours truly. And uh, quite often, more often than not, we have a special guest. And today, we've got a very special guest. He's uh, somebody I interviewed back in 2019, which was, I believe, the first time I ever interviewed him. And he's a fellow Canadian. And uh, his name is Mark Laurie, all the way from Calgary. So... Uh, Mark, the last time I talked to you was 2019. Yeah, we go back a ways. Do you remember those days? Oh, I do. <laughs> Actually, we had you in, I brought you as a speaker in the 90s. Oh. You spoke in Mount Royal in your bare feet. It was hilarious. I did. You did. In his bare feet. Yeah, he had a big long story. I think he, he burned about 15 minutes just talking about his feet before he got going. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't talk. You sure? You sure? You're, you sure you're not thinking about what's his name from from Wisconsin? Because he used to do bare feet quite a bit I too. I got it was you. <laughs> uh, early two thousands with uh, Abbas, Albumipoka. No, no. Okay. Well, there you go. I must have done way <laughs> too many drugs when I was uh, a teenager. So <laughs> it'll, it'll come back to me. Day. It'll come back to me at three in the morning. I'll wake up. And it'll haunt me like a bad dream. So, but uh, <laughs> no, I'm really excited to have you back here. Um, just a quick bio for those who don't know Mark. Mark's been a longtime player in the industry and kind of a niche. I'm going to say niche photography, but do correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you do a lot of really intense stuff with boudoir, and it blows me away. Two things that you can create a niche that is so successful, right to the point where you actually got a Wikipedia entry, which I'm totally blown away by. And uh, we were talking about that just before we went live and how I only know two photographers at our kind of level where they have a Wikipedia entry, you and uh, Thomas Dodd. And I would assume that anybody who's a photographer creating higher art and somehow getting themselves established in the art world and perceived as an artiste with credentials and whatnot, it's pretty hard to get a Wikipedia entry. Many have tried, many have failed. You have to have le legitimacy. So um, don't know if you're willing to talk about that at some point in time, but I certainly would like to know. But uh, all that aside, I was mentioning 2019. You know, don't you find it weird that, I don't know if it's me, but I got this like BC and, you know, before COVID and COVID and <laughs> everything has changed. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think back 2019, things were kind of normal. We didn't all walk around half scared to death and, yeah, wearing masks and whatnot. So, uh, give us a quick update on uh, sort of what you've been doing since the pre-COVID days, and and maybe yeah. talk a little bit about your history and uh, if you so much noted. history. The one the thing I'm always get more buzzed about is having photographs in outer space. I, I think that's even cooler than Wikipedia. It's like, how does that work? Um, we got approached. I was doing a, a trade show back in the. 80s i guess it was maybe early 90s i can't quite remember i have to look it up and this guy was up from uh, the states and he was um touring some family or friends or something we walked past our booth and he goes these are great we're putting together a uh, a time capsule in space do you want to be part of it I go, yeah sure that sounds pretty good wow this is cool send us some stuff so we had um three and one is a collage of images and they're all one's body painting the other ones are nude and they're on board. They've been up circling the planet now for a long time. Who knew? It was kind uh, of cool. And that, is, got... that is really bizarre and fascinating all at once. Uh, is that something you would do? Well, because it's so fun and quirky and unique. And also to, because I noticed you're pretty, I don't want to say aggressive. You're very active in your marketing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, your emails, I uh, got your latest email, mm -hmm. and I'd like to talk about that too because you seem to be doing a lot of promoting. And so with this space thing, does that give you content for creating a buzz in your local area? Yeah, we. it sort of pops up. It's been, It's been. We've got so many things that are, we're working on, so many things that are kind of behind me. It's one of, of many things. We're in our website right now, and we, you know, we, we try to trim down accolades and, and activities and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, just you know, I I get curious about things. We do our water sets and our milk throws, which are fun. Right. Um, you know, dress girls in milk as a throw thirteen glasses, twenty glasses of milk at them, and compose it afterwards, which is a blast. Yeah. Um, and so there's a, a lot of things we just kind of work with. So it, it comes up. People always, if you know, we're doing an interview, you throw that in, and people that's kind of cool. But you know, we, we've also have done. Um, we took our 
the impact. This is back in the 80s when there's no other photographer doing this in Western Canada at the time, as what I'm aware of. Um, so we kind of were establishing what boudoir photography was in nudes back at that point, giving it a, a place to be. So it's the only thing I've ever done. We don't do we don't do weddings and family groups on the side. Some of our clients will come in and request that, but it's not part of a marketing thing. You go to our website and this is all we do. If you search my name, this is pretty much it. Yeah. And and that's one of our, our pride and joy pieces. But back then, uh, the doctors working with rape and abuse victims um, kept on noticing that people would jump one or two levels of uh, recovery. And every time they did, my name came up. So they did, really? a, white, they did a white paper on us. Uh, studies for an entire year, talked to every one of our clients before, after, and then several months after, or I think almost a year later, um, to see how it kind of held. And so that's kind of cool to have a you know white paper done about us and our wow. technique and our approach because it was, uh, they couldn't find anything at the time um, that was quite like the way we approached um, the clients and the photography and, and so on. Mm -hmm. and a lot of the stuff that I do now is the roots go way back to, to then, you know, the, and the CBC picked up a story on it. And it was so cute. They spent like four days talking to my clients and myself. And then I was, so I was pretty young. I was feeling that's a pretty cool TV guy. So I'm expecting like a, like a one hour special or half hour special. So I asked the guy, yo, so how long is this going to run? And he says, well, you'll get about 14 minutes. I'm thinking three days for 14 minutes. My name did and yeah. I was like, yeah. that's all? And he says, well, let me put this way, Mark. If the president of the United States gets shot, he'll get five minutes. You'll still get 13. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So I thought that was so I thought that was uh, was kind of cool. Perspective. Like, yeah, it kind of got me in the right. But we even had a TV show back in the day as well. I had a 12-episode TV series on uh -huh. raw news called Spirit Photography. The funny thing was is that the the director directly above me he knew what we were doing but he kind of soft sold it to the guy above him who soft sold it to the guy above him mm -hmm. and eventually the guy that reported to the owner and the boss of the whole thing he just took him out for lunch rather than tell him what we were doing okay and then the last episode which was a full nude episode um he couldn't take him out for lunch so this guy's workaway looks up and then there he is you know nudes on his tv set and, yeah. and it turned out we're the only show that nobody complained about not even the little lady that always complained about everything so, really <laughs> they let it slide <laughs> yeah people complain about anything and everything why why do you think they didn't complain they must have been drawn into it for I yeah because we, we we talk um i mean it's kind of they're nudes but they're always so wholesome as, as sort of you know there's a style and a class to them and elegance to yeah. them and the women that were on the show it wasn't just like here's naked personal pause um they were telling their stories and yeah. this is, again this is going back to the maybe late 80s early 90s well we also did bought uh we're doing paintings back then um stuff that you do digitally now back then i would tune up with an airbrush artist yeah. i remember those we, days yeah and so we would paint an entire background because of course back then photoshop was such a, a baby software i did one photoshop thing um the client wanted it was large and i want to print on watercolor paper and at that time there's only one printer in Canada that could, there was two of them that could print them as uh, Iris Inkjet. And one of them was here and they did stuff from Russia. They all spoke Russian. Right. And, and we had a, a 30 by 40 on water paper. I found the paper and I took in these guys and I said, why don't you make a print a photograph? Can we have the printer? And they said, no, 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 oil stuff. No speak, don't do that. Uh -huh. I couldn't get across. Finally I go, naked lady, Tuesday. <laughs> 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 it, took, it tied up the machine though for a week because the file was so large. We, need, we did it. The we had to take everything off the the Apple computer with just oh, the operating really? system, Photoshop, and my file. Wow! And uh, it, it fortunately, it came out with the with the the nude the top nude part first. So they they hung around for a while. With it. it was, it was huge. <laughs> they yeah, wanted to see. It was thing. it was like a week of, of them. That's the only thing that was on the process. So there's some guy up in in Russia that was not getting his. Uh, his core sample printouts. For a right. Week. That's amazing. Was, That's uh, going way back. This is called yeah. this is primitive technology, but yeah, kind of ahead of its time, all things considered. Yeah. And we combined that one at that time we did airbrushing. We combined airbrush elements. Okay. What she was is she was dying of leukemia at the time. This is not a lot of the advances we have now. And mm -hmm. she created a room. It was her power room. And whenever she felt really bad and was really struggling, she'd go in this room and she had she used to travel out. So she had all these artifacts under all these highly symbolic things. There's a bunch of uh, shaman things that were in the room. And then dominating this entire front of the couch, because the room wasn't that large, was this photograph we did of her. Mm -hmm. And that 
Really? That got her through so many stuff. She'd just sit there and she had, we had a whole bunch of symbols embedded into it and lots of things. And she would absorb the energy that was, that we had put in that infused her, that she mind herself. That's who she was. Yeah. And it was a, a huge thing. That's pretty powerful. Uh, I got to ask you a question about that. Sure. I, I want to go back to the white papers and all that, everything you were talking about. And well, there's, there's two things I want to bring up. The first thing is, is what you're saying is, mm -hmm. and this is a, an interesting observation that I've made. I've been fascinated by this. I don't understand it, but there it is. And I don't participate in it because I'm mostly shooting fairies and families and mm -hmm. little uh, fam uh, weddings. Mm -hmm. But I've heard of this healing that seems to happen with women. And this is primarily yeah. what we're talking about, yeah. right? It's, yeah, it is. And it, it's, it's massive. Um, we have evolved that to the point. Right now, when we started doing it, we recognized that. And we talked about empowerment and confidence um, that people would get from our photo shoots. And that's become a mainstay now. Mm -hmm. uh, but what's evolved to at this point is, and we've evolved a lot of different kind of groups, is that we have our new thing called Beyond Empowerment. And we are probably, I think, the only studio that I'm aware of in North America that actually has a psychologist on staff. Really? And she is part of the photo shoot. So it's, and we had our first girl do it. And it was just, this, the feedback was amazing. She, um, she, her bit of history for her was when she was 16, she had an abortion. Uh, you can imagine how traumatic that would be. Uh -huh. um, she's had a, a bunch of other just phenomenal stuff. I don't know how she's still functioning. If it had been me, I think I would have just said, I'm looking for the way out. Mm -hmm. um, so she can, she has a challenge. She came in for a photo shoot. Um, our, my, uh, Bonnie, the psychologist, sat down with her for about an hour, about 45 minutes, I guess, because she was pretty excited about the photo shoot. Started to tell her what to be aware of, what to watch for internally, how she could use these things. So we went through the photo shoot, which was a, a two-hour session for her. Most girls go to the four-hour photo shoots. Having uh -huh. her makeup that starts the front of it. Uh, then she spent about an hour and a half with her, two hours afterwards. And what she was doing at that point was was making her notice things that she felt and stuff that she did in the photo shoot. So she could right. be aware of them. So this is, most people are kind of aware of them, but this is like, did you notice this? Did you see this? This is how you felt. This is what it means. Here's some tools, how to bring it back. So uh -huh. now she can take her experience that she has there, her sense of power and control, uh -huh. and she can infuse it later on. So then she was talking to about a week later, and she's the supervisor of a, of, a, of a store of some sort. And she had a customer and a staff situation that blew up. And she said, normally, I would be on my butt struggling with emotional things for about two weeks to a month. I could take uh -huh. that long to kind of climb back out of it. Uh -huh. She says, I, I dug back in with the tools Bonnie gave me and the, and the, um, the power of the photo shoot. And an uh -huh. hour, I was fine. And then four days later, her boyfriend had a horrible day. She said, normally when he has a horrible day, we wallow in it for like a week. And then I took my tools, went back to the photo shoot experience. And within an hour, we were fine. We were laughing about it. And wow. she said, and we're, we're talking to her now. It's been about a month, two months have gone by. Yeah. And checked in with her and she said, oh yeah. She said, I'm using this thing on a daily basis. Um, yeah. that part? We had a, years ago, I was teaching a course in the States. I did a whole lot of that. And um, one of the guys took it up and he had a client that came in and, and he booked a photo shoot. She came in on a Sunday and she finished the shoot and they're leaving and he's feeling pretty good. This is first uh, doing first thing, doing a nude and boudoir photo shoot from my teachings. And all of a sudden the client starts says, you know, we got to book another photo shoot. I felt, you know, and he stopped. He says, because that's the only means somebody's not happy about their photo shoot, right? Something was missed, right? Right. He said, well, wait, maybe you should wait to see these. We've got some great shots. He goes, oh, no, she says you misunderstand. This was amazing. Yeah. I felt better about myself than that I did after a visit with my psych psychologist. Wow. So I'm going to dump him and I'm going to come here every Sunday and I'll spend what I spent with him on you. <laughs> <laughs> so she brings in her girlfriend. She, so they block off every month. They block off a whole Sunday. And he says, you know, those psychologists, Mark, they get paid a lot of money and they dump them and they just they just come in for photo shoots. They buy a bunch of prints from their quite wealthy individuals yeah. and uh that's become i talked to him six months into it and she says yeah this is their thing they, they rather than go to the doctors feel good about themselves they just come in and have their photographs done you've that's become their psychologist yeah that's the whole process it's, well, it's a whole new definition to the term yeah. sexual healing i said the word <laughs> sexual but we're talking about a woman's sexuality and her her self-esteem via yeah. her self-image
Yeah, there's a uh, whole thing. Which I'm going to guess is a far uh, more re- a valued thing for women than it is for men. I mean, well, some guys are, you know, more that way. But I'm thinking on average, we we don't. Like, I mean, you think about the amount of work and effort and money and resources that goes into how a woman looks. And you think of it as a, from a biological viewpoint, you know, I mean, it's nature, yeah. nature, it's exemplified throughout nature, whether it's plants, animals, uh, or whatever we, uh, we, we, we want to be attractive, especially women. I mean, that's, that's a very powerful thing. So via that, via what you're creating and you've created a whole, I'm going to say only coming on to 40 years now, you've been doing this. Actually, it's about 43 now. Yeah. 22. I started the company in 1980. I've uh-huh. been doing photography for two years prior to that. I, I think in that first year or so, I think I may have done five weddings to see what they're like and decide that's just not my bag. What your thing? Um, you know, we build sets. Uh, we spent the first <laughs> year just so everyone understands I'm not an elitist. Uh, what you see behind me, uh, we're still uh-huh. in the same, you know, thousand square foot else we started uh, for the first year. This, was my first year first no first uh first 10 years this uh-huh. was my studio consultation room i did projections down here so every time uh, there's a room behind us behind that back wall there and mm-hmm. i have all my props because i built sets and so on and i had a, a rollout on the side wall that would roll out and it ha- held uh, my eight foot by four foot boards to make my backdrops there's little pins in the wall to hang things into i i had the ceiling uh, these rafters go uh, across i guess uh, perpendicular so yeah. i tin foiled one of the rafters and painted it and had a light up there to give me a hair light because i've only got seven less just, just under seven foot ceilings okay i had a roll buried up inside so i had to make the space work and then for mm-hmm. viewings i i bought in in the 80s i discovered projection yep. um, from a guy named leonard and uh so i had this on the floor which is orange concrete because i covered it up with so I was just that's what was painted there. I would uh, mark an X. So if I put my projector on there, I'd get a 16 by 20 and I'd right. put it back. It'd be a 20. I mean, that's how basic I was to get these things. But even before I had that, I, I projected proofs yeah. um, on my white, my wife's white um, oven. That's yeah. the biggest space I had to just, like, I believed <laughs> in projections, right? And so we, we came a long way to, to yeah. that. To, and we're still in the same place. This is now just for consultation and viewings. We built a studio in the backyard. When we're done, it, it looks like it's a garage, but it's uh, 12 foot ceilings, heated floor. Nice. All the plugins are in the ceiling rather than the wall, so I can nice. do that sets. There's a stone ruins, Red Rock Canyon, spiral staircase, a badass back alley, then a main area where a log cabin goes. Then we have a bunch of fabrics to kick into it, a makeup area. Wow. All that kind of space that we went into. And it, when we were building it, it the, I, the guy contract kind of fell apart. So my friend says, well, we can build it. You'll be the manager of it. And I was terrified because I've, you know, Huh. This is not my strength. And one up he told me this is what it's gonna cost. And I wound up doubling that. And I was, uh-huh. I was just terrified. Uh-huh. But within about six months, because I could I didn't have to take this room apart anymore, like I didn't have yeah. to make the studio and so so I just I could walk away. I could do my photo sessions, walk away, and then do the viewing here. So I was able to triple my photo sessions and we had it paid for in six months, which was nice mind blowing for us. So it was a good move. It was cool. It was so you, you have you have a home studio, so to speak. Yeah, we were, we were one of the uh, always breaking ground. Uh, back in the day, I was the first photographer. So when PPOC was first going to be, you had to, you had to have a business license and you had to have a studio. Back then, you weren't really a photographer, you're a hobbyist. Mm. If you didn't have a, any a studio, like a storefront studio, like anybody yeah. who was, say, I'm a professional photographer, there's my building. Right. Um, and the people who didn't, they were just sort of hobbyists, um, getting kind of getting by uh, different times that were back then and yeah. i was the first photographer that didn't have a studio and we hit the point that where i could move out my clients said no we like coming it's income no one knows what we're coming for if you're a okay. student in a mall and yeah. when we walk in oh she's going to get naked or lingerie or whatever so they uh-huh. husbands could drop them off they had no idea this going to a tea party as far as he's concerned so that's really kind of cool so we're important. the first photographer it was a great debate went in whether i should be allowed because you know i had a business i had a license i was at, at that point uh, making more money than some of the main street photographers were, but there was a lot of reluctance to kind of let me in. And that's also, I think. I yeah. Things were different back then. I remember they those. Were. Yeah, they were. Uh, you had to make 80% of your income in photography. I didn't that's really, right. 
didn't know he had to have a studio. Maybe that was before I, jo I joined in 87. Yeah. Well, I was kind of like the norm back then, like photographer yeah. anyway, was that yeah. if, if you're a photographer, you had a studio. And that was just like, this is our place of business. If mm -hmm. you're in your home, you're, you're not really, you know, a business person. Like, that, I mean, everybody back then, there's very few places unless you're, a, you know, a contract, a construction worker that, that had, you know, an acreage or stuff was stored in there. It was just the way it was back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's mind blowing that um, you've been able to create a prosperous and successful, long lasting niche. Mm -hmm. And as a man, um, do you always have a woman present when you're shooting? And no. what, is, what is it that's working? I mean, they trust you, obviously. Yeah. So the process we go through, and it's the same, we sort of developed it way back in the 80s and we sort of fine tune it into it, um, is we. I mean, back then, all of the when this kind of got going, because back then the, the roles been flipped. At, at that time, all the photographers were men, and, and the yeah. women were retouch artists and doing the books. Yeah. And now the industry's flipped. There's the majority of women are photographers, and most mm -hmm. are, are women in most disciplines, yeah. except maybe commercial, and that's probably even changing. And the guys are doing the books and doing the retouching. Um, yeah. So our process is we always meet with them first. Um, so I spend like a half hour, forty five minutes, where they get to know us connect, get comfortable, feel safe. Uh -huh. um, we then do the makeup. Now for Jan's just recently retired, but uh, for decades, she would spend the first hour doing the hair and their makeup. So, okay. um, so she would be out there. And then we found that having a third person whose job was just to wait in case something concerned somebody uh -huh. uh, was actually make our clients uncomfortable because they were building rapport with me and not with them. So, and then Jan had better things to do. So she would leave, but they all knew that she was just like, you know, across the, the causeway in the house and she would, she could pop in and, and when a woman had so much control, we sort of tell them that we are, it's an elaborate form of self-portrait uh, mm -hmm. so that they have all this control. Um, th and this is and back in those days, it was film I was shooting with. So I, in four wow. hours, I'd shoot four rolls of film. So I had to really make each pose count because I had the large format camera, which is the RZ at the time. So I only yeah, get 40 photographs. Yeah. So I would have to make a living from taking 40 photographs. So if a girl only bought, say, five, I'd go broke. I had to have uh -huh. them buy at least 20 to 25 of the of the 40 images, aiming for 30. So I'd have a really high success rate. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, to knock it out of the park. Yeah. I was recently, I was watching a girl, and she was berating the audience and saying, you've got to to uh, show your clients less. You know, don't show them, it'll overwhelm them. I was thinking, well, I'll show my clients, you know, I show them everything, uh, 140 photographs from a session for our four hour session. Okay. And I thought, well, maybe I'm showing too many photographs. So I guess you'd look it down. And somebody asked her, well, like, how many do you show? And she says, well, I take in the two hours, she says, I'll take about 600, 800 photographs. Right. And then, and I, but they don't see those. I pair that down to 200. So I'm thinking, okay, okay so <laughs> I take less than you show. I, th I think I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> You started to uh, second guess based on what your false assumption was. Yeah, and then as soon as somebody said, "Here's the reality," like, okay, no, I'm I'm still doing good. I uh, suppose it's a good question, a, a good idea to always be questioning um, and always be willing to adapt and yeah. learn and go yeah. with the flow and test. You know, you don't want to throw everything out, but you know, oh. look back and say, okay, like we did that with when I was shifting to digital. Back in the day, I started. I still do my large format camera, which is like a relic now. They don't, I mean, they've stopped making the DSLRs. I, <laughs> everything's a relic. Uh -huh. so, um, but we started doing the digital shots because back then, digital in the '90s, digital was was still pretty weak in terms of what it came out with. It was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the kids yeah. are starting out today cannot grasp that that how bad <laughs> the stuff was and how small they were. Yeah. And they'd say, you know, the, the the phrase was, "This is pretty good when you consider it's digital." But for my prices, I couldn't do the tag on. This just has to be pretty good, and you should mm -hmm. be able to tell the difference between if you order oh. two wall prints and one's from the negative, a six seven negative, and one's from a digital file. Um, they can't go. I can't give them an excuse. They're the same price. Mm -hmm. and so what happens? We started noticing that more people were buying the the digital shots. For, to show them both, even though we weren't charged them for that part of the session, yeah. and the print shots. And the the final thing, this was I had a D twenty at the time, so the file was eight megs. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty ruthless about my exposures uh, and how I process things. And so, I had a client ordered two forty by fifty inch images, one from a six by seven negative, and one from my eight meg, uh, you know, Photoshop version 
four at the time, I think, or seven yeah. <laughs> image, and they're going to hang side by side. Right. And I was just terrified because it oh, yeah. had, and then they went up, and he couldn't tell the difference. Yeah. As to Rob, I think Rob still uses Photoshop one, so it doesn't make a difference. So. <laughs> no, I'm up to date, but not that long ago, I was still in Photoshop seven. Uh, well, you know, it's just tools. I use the same yeah. tools over again but uh interesting that you say that and that that was your pivotal moment where you thought well this is it digital is the way to go obviously yeah. and you switched over 100 percent, i would assume i uh, actually yeah so what part of the post led up to it is that kodak kept on deleting films my my film that still beats my heart is vps3 i remember that and I just, I had that tweaked. And, and even when I print out a, a, a file, when I scan a file from that, it still has, has tone. Sorry about the cat's tail here. I, I, <laughs> I need to go for a walk. She's, a, <laughs> she's a nice looking kitty. Look at her. Um, got that brindle fur. Then they deleted it. They, they got rid of like 500 rolls of film. That was one of them. And so I found a, yeah. a transparency film and we started using that. And then they got rid of that film mm -hmm. about the same time that our, our digital was hitting the quality level. And yep. that's what I thought, you know, that's amazing. That I really, I, <laughs> I really don't want to, there's not a roll of film that could give the skin tones I want. Cause I yep. have so much skin tone. I got to look after. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so <laughs> the same thing in retouch there's, we do ladies in their forties, fifties that the oldest is girl in her nineties. And um, we have lines full body. So when, you know, some, that's what drives my assistant up the wall. They'll, these firms will, brag about the retouching they have a retouching program or retouching software and they, they bring in some model who's like 25 years old yeah they say, see we can do this like in 20 minutes and fran goes when you bring in somebody who's 65 years old has had three kids and stretch marks over body and that can happen really good then i'll watch it but when yeah. you keep on using 25 year old models to show you how yeah. good they are you know, yeah i know what you're saying and, and that drives me nuts mm -hmm. You know, somebody gets a new camera and they're new to photography and they shoot pretty looking young girls and there's my portfolio. Yeah. Uh, does, there's something questionable about that. I, I hate to sound cynical, but as a wedding photographer, you see these elaborate scenes as well, you know, with a, a bride and a groom in front of this amazing yeah. you yeah. Know, uh, architectural. I'm like... <laughs> We ain't got that here in my city. Yeah. <laughs> well, and the thing, then you look at the lighting for a lot of these cases and you go, well, when you get rid of all the beauty of the place and the beauty of the people and the expensive clothes and the 10 assistants you've got going, yeah, that's really a basic glamour light. Like there's, there's no skill to that light. Like no. you, you have this broad thing with it. Like you, you can't screw yeah. up unless you go out of focus. Yeah. Um, I sit with the competitions. You'll have a, you'll have a, two photographers, and the one has a, a girl that comes in, and she's 15, and she's a mom, and she's got some stuff that she's struggling with, and she's never in front of a camera before, and all those things. Are, and the photographer brings her up to here, and the next guy comes in. He has no idea what he's doing. Gets a hot model and a beautiful background. He comes up to here. He's just like, and he gets the prize. Yeah. And we're going, this guy here, way better photographer because yeah. he's yeah. brought the average client almost up to the point that his image is as good as the guy that's got the, the unreal background and so on. Something to be said about that. And, and, and that also aligns with the, uh, something you were saying earlier when you were talking about going from film to your 20 megabyte uh, camera file and you didn't see the difference. And it, really that to me illustrates the point that the technical side of things doesn't matter to the client. I'm sure it's 110% got everything to do with the experience that you're bringing to them yeah. and you've built in, in a lifetime. You're at the point now, I would assume, mm -hmm. you are so entrenched in your community and with what you do in your niche. Uh, I don't want to say this, but if you literally stopped all marketing, you, there's probably enough momentum there that people would be keep coming back to it, you. And it carried for a while. The, the kids um, that, are, that come up there, their marketing is really good. Like I'm, I still miss my old days where I could buy a, you know, the largest yellow page ad. That's a book for people who don't know. It's like a paper Google, if you will. <laughs> paper Google. <laughs> Just so you know, um, I would take out two full page spreads in the in the in the Calgary Sun in right. color. Um, it's the story they do on me and I'd be in two trade shows. You did that? Yeah. And that would be, you know, I, we got away that they published stuff and because of my reputation, they'd publish stuff that no one else could publish that we'd be turned really? away because of who we were with. Um, and we we're also deeply, part of this is because we're deeply involved in charity. Um, and okay. so 
when we started, and it's fun now because people say, oh, we're going to, young kids come up, we're going to, we're involved in charity too, we're going to outshine this. That's really cool because in 43 years, I have donated $512,000 to charity. So, wow. You know, come wow. close. <laughs> Who knew? You know, so we've also photographed about 5,200 women and over that same time frame. That's amazing. And so it's kind of, of the amount amazing. of women you photographed, how many were uh, repeat clients? Oh, I didn't keep track of that stat. Roughly, we're, take a while yeah, shot. What, we're yeah. probably, our repeat clients, because of what we charge, I mean, a lifetime thing is probably pretty low. Like the clients that come back are probably closer to maybe 10%, mm. 15%. Okay. Um, you know, you'll come in and spend like our range of clients in the last, let's say, 15 years, 10 years, where they would spend from about $3,000 to $80,000 for stuff in one year, expenditure wow. in one year for it. And so if you've, spent like we had one girl for an example she came in and this is going back a bit but she spent i think it was like ten thousand dollars now what she did she's single and every year she would save and go on an adventure so the year before me her adventure was to go to uh, as a crew hand to help offset the price uh to the antarctic and walk with the penguins that was her oh, adventure really? and that cost them more money then she saved up for us and that was you know, she spent the same amount of money with us as she spent when she went to walk with the penguins. But she nice. she actually only went to the penguins once, but she had to come back twice for us over within five years. That's amazing. Um, but she so really it becomes the same thing. They really want to go and have that experience done with yeah. you. I uh, I think about this often. Do you you know Judy Cormier? Out of Oakville area. Um, it, doesn't ring a bell, but I'm not great with last names. I have so many of them that come at me, so it's quite she, possible. Uh, she was a wedding photographer, and yeah. then she got into boudoir 100%, mm -hmm. and now she 100%. All she does is high-end uh, boudoir mm -hmm. retouching. That's what she does 40 hours a week. She's so busy, she had to hire two people to help her out. We had her on a couple weeks ago, eh, Johnny, about six weeks ago or so. Something like that. It was the second time having her on. Yeah, we had her on last year, and uh, we just like to... I always enjoy talking to her. She So, but... It blows me away that she's 100% earning a really decent living doing nothing but retouching. She likes doing retouching, and mm -hmm. I don't know if I do that. But that's not the point. The point is this, is that it's such a massive market, and all her clients are American-based. Yeah. And there are photographers out there, almost all women. I don't mm -hmm. know if there's any single man in there who's doing any boudoir. And I always thought, well, this is really turning into a, a woman's uh, domain. And... Uh, so you obviously uh, proven that wrong in many in many ways, but it seems to me a much much bigger market than most of us are aware of. Uh, yeah, it it is huge. I think something that I mean, there's a whole there's workshops like there's um, in person three four day um, workshop or not workshop conference events mm -hmm. with photographers that kind of come into it but you're right about the uh, about the guys like i've when i started it was you know all male photographers doing everything yep. Yep. and now in in our area like in southern alberta um there i'm the only male photographer it's all women who've done it yeah and and so we've actually having to i think in i've i think i've located about four who are doing it as, as a profession i'm sure there's some hobbyists and guys that, that kind of poke along with it but who people who are like this is my only livelihood there's probably about four or five that I've, that i found and so our new website is, is addressing that and it's it was intriguing because when i was talking to the psychologist so we have a whole a video and and you know eight, I think eight reasons why why the advantage of a male photographer but the cool thing was with bonnie uh and her whole thing is is uh, working with uh, women who've gone through trauma and she's explaining that in a photo shoot with a guy, there's a whole different chemistry. What a, a woman projects uh, really? that doesn't happen with a woman. So, in a in a female thing, a woman will, will try her, her sexy look, but there's no energy there. Like it's uh -huh. not the same. So there, it's like a girl's photo shoot. So they do sexy things, but it's a woman woman's perception of what's sexy, and it's not okay. always correct. The same thing when when guys do something, they think, well, this is really sexy, and and the woman goes right. seriously, like you're such a clod. And <laughs> so she was saying that the energy that happens. Um, and especially when it's in a safe environment, when the woman can be uninhibited, there's no, yeah. there's no free or concern. So you got to put, put that part of the equation into place. Um, and this is different than, you know, some, some guy just shooting, you know, models kind of thing. Um, the energy and the sensuality that comes out of the photographs is different, even when yeah. you're not 
doing really? uh, and the sense of power um, because you, when you're working with a woman, they'll, there's a level of empowerment will happen because you're, you're taking these kind of shots. It's a whole different intensity when the woman's in control of the photo shoot. Like, like she has veto over poses. I toss ideas out. She doesn't like something. I just tell them I take rejection very well. I'll, uh -huh. I'll get it. Okay. So their sense of power in the moment is huge. And you can't get that with a, with a girlfriend kind of thing for it. Now, as, as I say, these things, um, there's, there's really some stunning and incredible female photographers out there. So I'm not trying to run yeah. their praise. We just bring a different element um, that a, um, the, the same thing when if I'm photographing a guy, we, we do that whole do to our thing. Uh, we get a guy kind of coming in. There is a locker room energy as opposed to a sexual okay. energy. Okay. Like, like it's going to happen with me. It's the same kind of thing. Like, you know, mm -hmm. we're a bunch of guys taking these cool shots. Um, uh -huh. This is what the girls going to like. You know, here we go. Um, and that's the same thing that women face is that they get, you know, yeah. they get the perception of sexy. Uh, the poses are, are different. Um, and, and even the similar poses, then they there's an energy like that still happens with body language and so that's one of the things i pose rather than tell people well here's a smile you know smile for me i've got the whole the whole body has to communicate the same thing right so it's got you if you're giving a sexy look the whole body language has to match what the face is doing that's pretty intense that i've never ever occurred to me that they would perceive and react like the photographer would perceive mm -hmm their version of what a sexy look looks yeah. like and the subject would respond differently. Yeah. So you're saying that because you're a man, they will give you a specific, the more correct, authentic version of what that ought to look like. Yeah. And, but more so you have the ability, you're aware of it, obviously. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, were you always aware of that or did it sort of evolve? Um, it, I think I pretty much always, I had it to a large degree because we, we ramped up so quickly with people coming okay. to us. Um, but as, as I got, and again, cause I got so many years behind me, there's, I'm not sure when the moment happened, mm -hmm. but I, th I think for me, the biggest thing that happened, I build sets and I create environments and we do store playing. This is back in the eighties. Yeah. Um, it's, we've refined it to the point that, uh, one of okay. my, one of the people I was working with, he says, I know what you do. He says, you have, you're very intuitive with your subconscious and your subconscious communicates your client subconscious. Okay. It knows what they want. And so yeah. that gets translated to it's a bit wooey, but this is what you he felt happened. Do you think it's true? Or? Yeah. So he he says, so what happens is when you're because you're you're connecting with your subconscious, is you can inherently feel where they're where they want to be pushed to. Because when women come in, they want to push boundaries. You when you want empowerment and you want confidence, you can't get it by going to the same comfortable place you've been. Yeah. It's like if you're gonna as we're talking to one client, it's kind of like it's say you you leap off a block. So you're going through a fitness thing, and there's a two foot block, and you leap off that block, and that feels really good because you've leapt four feet and yeah. you're okay. But when you leap out of a out of a say uh, one of those test things where you drop eight feet or ten feet, right. that feels really, really good. And then you jumpy bunch and you drop even more. But <laughs> when you go out of an airplane, the amount of confidence and empowerment you get when you leap out of an airplane, that's so different than jumping off of a four-foot block. <laughs> so the same thing happens with the photography. We found with women, the less clothes they have on and the more bolder their stances are, the more their empowerment and confidence right. wraps up, becomes mm -hmm. huge. So when we talk about empowerment and confidence, some girls come into us, like Shaylin, who was with the first uh, Beyond Empowerment thing, they are really in a low space they've been really battered and they have a long ways to go to have the same confidence as say an average person but we get women coming in who are oh i mean they're they own international companies yeah. and and they are bold women but what in their world two percent mm. more confidence is a massive difference like that's right. that two percent is huge at that level so when they're bar, for us their bar is pretty high that two percent yeah like they arrive strutting and feeling confident uh, and they're looking at that little extra hit okay and so they'll the average person may not see it but they can feel it and and so when we talk empowerments to all people all levels a lot of people miss that they're looking for people who are clearly struggling with confidence issues and yeah. body issues That's we've amazing. also found women at, at the high-end levels that you look and go oh my god you've got the whole world to support your clothing and your fitness and your food and the whole bit, but they'll, they'll still have stuff that bothers them. There's still, we all have insecurities, male, female, like it doesn't really matter where we are. There's stuff that we, you know, in a cold, dark corner, you go, yeah, really, if 
I'd be happier if that foot didn't have such a strange look to it. <laughs> That's really cool. I like the metaphor going from a four foot block to an airplane. Yeah. Uh, but I want to go back to the yeah. subconscious thing you mentioned yeah. and you as a man and their perception. So if I'm going in, I've, I've done a bunch of boudoir. I mean, yeah. I haven't, I've done like, you know, I've done way more of everything else. I just, I find it very frustrating and mm -hmm. I don't find it easy. And, uh, but I'm also hyper aware, you know, I have four sisters, so I'm very aware of boundaries and sexuality. And, yeah. uh, and I'm like, if I have thoughts, <laughs> yeah, if I'm hiding them, if I'm sexually attracted to them, that's, mm -hmm. they're going to pick up on that, you know? So there's got to be a push for, uh, sort of managing that or, um, uh, or being able to be aware of it and uh, be professional is professionalism in, in yeah. some degree. What it advice? Is, well, what happens is to be absorbed. Like when you're, so if a woman comes in uh, and a guy for that matter as well. So if you're a female in the audience is this, this, what we're happy in here works if you're doing the boudoir, the doudoir photography. But what happens is you, let's say they got perfect breasts or a perfect bum. Okay. So you don't have to do anything with that. It's, it's there. So now you're going to spend time, what to do with how you work with the tummy, how do you work with the legs? The legs right. are kind of short. How do I make them look longer? How do I um, get them comfortable? How do I bring out so I can with my language as I talk about things, my bad jokes and, and inspirations and insights? Yeah. I am guiding their emotional content. So when they start feeling uh, playful, yeah. their whole body's playful. Like we're in a playful mood. When they're feeling sensual, okay. the conversation has changed with it. Okay. All right. And they know that I'm harmless. I mean, we had one go in time. She, I show the, the, the photograph we did as a poly back in those days. And she goes, oh, my God. She says, what I give for man, any man to see this photograph, it looks so hot. And I go, hello. And she says, no, Mark. I mean, a real man. Like, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I feel much better about myself now. You think rejected very well, you said. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so you get absorbed. I mean, when you're doing a photo shoot uh, yeah. for a nude person uh, or lingerie, I'm deeply, I'm building sets. Um, I'm worrying about lighting because I don't work with a formula. Like no. a lot of the boudoir photography I see out there now, if you go through their websites, they've taken, you know, they're the same subscription websites. They've all gone available light and it's all the same dark moody kind of stuff. Right. And they bought, so some person says, the conference says, here's the 20 poses that sell. Do those right. to make a million. And, and they're mostly right. Yeah. Um, but they're going by the numbers. And so they're just in their back to brain. Okay, so let's get on a pose four. Now we're doing we're doing flow posing. So we'll do one, two, you know, they have that whole thing for it. And flow posing's got its place. But if you're trying to get something out of the person, that will yeah. handicap you because you're so tied up with doing the flow posing, you're missing the emotional content of what the person is giving you. Yeah, that's cool. And as soon as you start becoming a, so you've got their physical position, making the posing look good, all the, the stuff they're worried about, that's what you're fixing. The stuff that's good, it's, it's going to be good anyway. Yeah. Uh, what your lighting is going to be, how are you going to get them to that emotional state? Uh, what are you going to do after this one's done? Because you, you've done this pose. I'm moving my lights are done around, moving constantly as I'm changing yeah. shadows and shaping what I'm going to do with the light. And and I often I tell them I said, look, I'm gonna we're gonna experiment here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna it's these first couple shots may be disastrous because I'm doing something I've never done before with you. And and, okay. and they know that I'm you know that that's how we push my envelope is by doing stuff that, right. that we've never done before. And I tell them that I've never done this before. That's, that's how, how this works. So they appreciate <laughs> that. Yeah. And they appreciate and they, your yeah. your artistic yeah. endeavor, your artistic yeah. angle. And they, and we also have some people, they've got to give me something. Like we had a, a client a while ago that her vision, which is correct to a degree, was that if they turned me loose, my whole creativity, if, they, if she had no of her plans, and I, she'd get my most creative. But I can be creative in so many different directions. Uh -huh. They're unlikely to be the one that she wants. So I said, oh, God, I've been waiting to do this. And what we'll do is we'll hang you upside down, wrapped right. in chains, and then wrapped in uh, barbed wire with ketchup like you're bleeding. And we'll uh -huh. put you above a bucket with a ducky in it with candles on it, and you'll swing <laughs> back and forth. And she's like, you know, Mark, that bedroom set sounds really good. And suddenly she knew what she wanted, and it wasn't that. <laughs> Uh-huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> wasn't that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a process. It's a journey, uh, obviously. Yeah. yeah. And we can see the difference. We had uh, a girl that came in recently. Her, her, She'd first encountered us 10 years ago. And she talked to a girlfriend. She said, oh, my God, no, you can't do that. It's a waste of money. 
And then her girlfriend six months later went and did it with somebody else. But her son kept on saying for 10 years, you should do this, mom. It'd be really good for you. And this woman was extremely religious. And the reason that comes up in a second. So that was guiding her, but she just words from her girlfriend and her insecurities. And then her son suddenly died. It was 30, I think he was like 32 year old or something. And he had an abrupt death, which really shook her and shook her faith. I mean, she was telling that in the photo shoot. This is where the point where she hasn't spread his ashes yet. I think he's talking the ceremony. He had, the ceremony hadn't happened. So that's how, how close it was. I'm not sure what that time frame is, but it's within a month. He had passed away and she was still, she was questioning her faith because she had always been, mm -hmm. she was uncomfortable that she could take out anything because she knew that her God would never challenge her with more than she could do. And she'd always said that so long as nothing happens to my family, I'm good. I can take anything on. And suddenly her family is gone. So that was the, the core of her thing. So we're talking about doing this new photo shoot, but she also wanted to do a photograph that would, would be him. And the reason she was there was he was honoring his belief that she should do this. And that's why she was there. So now okay. we start off with the makeup and I got, and we were in our water set. So I got an eight, a 10 foot by 16 foot water platform with an assistant who does the spraying. Right. And she's just had the makeup done and she's crying because she's trying to explain to us her challenge with her faith and the struggle with this. And she has got an average mom, 55 year old mom's body um, to work with it. And right. they are her hus husband's native. And so there's, he's partially in. So there's these things. She had a feather and somebody had given her tulips right. and photographed this person. So, we got that one done first. So she had these bright colors. We put a, a reflective board right at the water level. We have a photograph of her looking at the water with the flowers and the tulips and the everything into it. Oh. And my assistant was watching all of this. And she said, there's a moment when her whole body language changed. Okay. And she was there. She And all of a sudden, she decided she wanted to nude. She, we put that portion, of that other stuff aside. Right. And she had the sense of freedom. And you could see in her body language. She had passed through it. Yeah. Oh. Um, she had discovered she could live with this and she had rediscounted a court rediscovered she explained at the end of it the photo shoot shoot allowed her to reconnect with her faith because she really? discovered this kind of, all these things were happening and more um with it to kind of come in the photograph was used and she was uh, it, for the uh, uh rem remembrance piece with it it's been enlarged for her house there's a whole bunch of things that happened i'm just sort of touching on some of the yeah. highlights that went through it but you could see uh, and you, in most cases if you're paying attention you will see within in my sessions it usually happens within about 15 minutes of them starting uh but sometimes the women aren't even aware that they're nude like we have one girl that suddenly she goes well what how did i get naked i said well about <laughs> two hours ago um i said can you hand me a robe and you just gave it to me so that's when you went that way you you're very casual about it and uh you look for those breakthroughs they, they all yeah. they all have a breakthrough do they they do That's, and you can and to different degrees like some people are they're coming from different places I mean, we had one girl her breakthrough and some of the breakthroughs we get are really dramatic so she had she had been going on a journey because she was missing about 10 years of her life she had no memories of 10 years of a young person of her life and she was slowly trying to unearth them mm -hmm. and the doctor told her that when the subconscious felt she was ready for her to accept something then the body would give her the next level so we're finishing her photo shoot and she sits down and she suddenly goes really, really pale. I said, are you okay? And she says, yeah. She said, I just, I just had a release. And I said, oh, is, is that good? She said, I guess so. I just remembered that my parents killed me and left me for dead in a ditch 20 miles from where I grew up. True and story. Kind of, so that, yeah. That's, so I'm I kind of like, like what? what? Said, yeah, that's, that's what my sub part of my, I still get goosebumps when I talk about this. So that's part of what my sub, but my subconscious is feeling that I'm stronger now and I could take this. So thank you for that. So that's really good. Oh. I'm not a trained professional, so please go see your psychologist right away. No kidding, man. But <laughs> wow. that's, a, like, that's a big thing wow. um, to do with. And I'm like, so I sit down beside her. And go, yeah, she says, I remember it now. But the, the people that found me uh, in the ditch, I turned out I wasn't dead. I was just beaten really badly. And and it wasn't until years that they, you know, they kind of connect with the parents. So they wow. never go back to them. And this whole, she was really young at the time, too. Nice parents. And so that we've had people come in who will be dead before the prints are finished like they are dying oh yeah and we're doing a photo shoot and it's really a tricky thing to do because you okay. they've got things they're wanting to accomplish there's stuff they want to give their husband there's things for their kids this is a, a story and we've got to be um, conscious of the moment of what they're going through because they are 
they know they're going to die. They know they're going to die within a within a month or a week, mm-hmm. kind of stuff. This is this is happening. It can't be stopped. There's no TV ending, and nobody knows she's there. This is this is her surprise thing. This will be released, and we'll be given uh, details from her estate on on who to pass these things over to. Like this is oh. is really emotional stuff for us. Wow, no kidding. To deal with. No and, kidding. And that's our thing. So we've got to cr- create as we go through her different needs and what she wants to express, we've got to create an environment that she feels safe and comfortable and free and stepping away from her, from her conclusion, you know, the stuff that I just, oh. I reversing roles. I would have, I think a hard time to be in, in the same space and have that mm-hmm. kind of headspace with it. That's so, freaking really. intense. So we get this wide range of people. And we got somebody that just comes in and they just, I'm here just here for a good time. What can we do? I just want to play and, push boundaries and, and see what it's going to be like. And they bring in all sorts of strange props to where we have props in the studio. We've had you know, one girl brought in her husband's collection of comic books. And I, I love comic books. I'm kind of aware of value. And she, she said, can we use these for props? And she, and they're all in cellophane. I'm looking, I said, yeah, we, we can. I'm looking at these and there's a bunch of like Spider-Man number 10 and stuff. And, mm-hmm. and she lays them out and she said, how would you organize this? So for, I'm not going to touch them. So should we take them out of the plastic bag? I don't think so. And there was around, I don't know, $200,000, $500,000 worth of comic books on my studio floor that we were having her nude body lay on top of. Yeah. And then uh, he came in to view them with him. And with he had no idea. And she comes in and he says, these yeah. are nice. And then we did stuff besides the comic books as well. And yeah. they had, um, he's, this is what he wanted. She says, well, these aren't cheap, dear. Um, you know, we can afford this. This was her plan. And he says, oh, I like these though. Give me 15 minutes. So he steps outside and we kind of look like we have no idea what's going on. Mm-hmm. He comes back in with this big grin and he drops down. He says, we'll take what I wanted. Uh-huh. He says, Dear, <laughs> she says, what's changed? Like our budget hasn't changed. He says it has. She <laughs> says, I sold Spider-Man and X-Men. Uh-huh. You're good. Now the look in her face. You can imagine this. She's sitting down there uh-huh. and her husband is collecting these since he's like 10 or something, right? Uh-huh. So these are his babies. Uh, he just sold two to fund photographs of her nude. Unbelievable. So you can imagine the rush that she gets out of that, mm-hmm. her sense mm-hmm. of importance and value in his life. There's yeah. no doubt at that point. That's, That's amazing. Massive. That's massive. You got so many stories like that. My, my, I just going to sound weird by asking this question, but when you said, when you just explained that shoot, my first thing I thought of, did you have a problem with all that cellophane and reflection? That's where we gotta be good photographers, like lighting gloss stuff. So mm-hmm. yeah, we, you, know, we you can see that it's you, you can see what you're working with. So you gotta adjust your lights to oh, yeah, to get yeah. them so they're kind of. I think at one point she did. She wanted to be reading one, so she she has one. So she had she had two versions of it. She took this thing out, and I'm kind of gasping because, and he was thrilled in the end. He says, "No, that's a good. We'll sell that one soon before no one knows what we did with it." But so she would <laughs> took it, and she had one shot because she she was kind of self conscious about her tummy, and she's nude. So uh-huh. she had one where it exposed everything except her tummy, and then we uh-huh. repositioned it where it hid everything. So right. she had a bit of cleavage and a bit of thigh, and everything else was kind of gone. So he had the right. really racy one, but he could expose the really good one and then tell people how hot the photograph was at home. And, of course, his cachet and her cachet both went through the ceiling. Like, like she did that. And, she, and we can see this. It's just really, it's just really amazing. <laughs> freaking amazing so uh we're coming up to an hour um so one prob- thing if people are interested in stories um if they go to women's empowerment stories.ca i'm going there women's empowerment, empowerment stories. stories.ca there's a free book there and there's six stories with photographs now we went in and to make it a bit modest my uh, assistant painted clothes and all the girls is that and your then, uh, your website uh, yeah, it's mine. It's, well, it's not my website. That's my, my website is innerspiritphoto.com. Uh-huh. Um, but that one is, um, women's empowerment stories. Did you create that? One? I created that one. Yeah. And it's, cool. uh, we created the book, my book and there, I mean, there's a, one of the girl's stories in there. She's, she got, um, uh, Lyme disease and she was so healthy. I, she had Lyme disease for, I think 10 or 15 years before she knew she had it. And she was in a house with black mold and it just tipped her body over and then she had all the issues with it. Yeah. Lyme disease, it goes in and it actually changes your personality. So you, so it can, so you start eating food that you want, recognizes that there's people that could be bad for it. And so it actually tries to separate. It's a very, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thinking entity. It's horrible. 
And mm -hmm. she got the book to remind her who she was. So yeah. it'd have a hard time changing her personality until she got stuff under, under That's control. Cool. So there's so many powerful stories in there. There's We had yeah. one girl, and this is also so people understand the real power of this stuff, which is empowerment and so on. I asked one client to photograph a couple of times if there's anything new. And she said, yeah. She says, I believe that the, as a result of the photo experience I've got here, I am making $80,000 more a year. Really? Than if I had not been photographed by you and had your experience. Holy shit, and, what a testimonial. And one, I, I just kind of blew up like that. That's <laughs> enormous. Like that's, that's qualitatively. <laughs> I am making $80,000 more a year because I was in your studio and had your experience. Is that in the women's empowerment stories.ca website? That story? What's that story? Is that, that story? In there? Um, she's in there. Uh, this happened. She revealed that to me. I think it was after we wrote that book. Oh, okay. that the book. It's, it's a relatively new thing she was looking at. Yeah, she said uh, she used to be a mechanic and she she liked to hide away. She, she was a heavy duty mechanic. And uh, because she had such a great story, I asked her if she'd speak to me. So she goes out to our charity events and and the trade shows and she just she, at one point we're at a trade show and she was she had her her, book, her photographs on a tablet yeah. and she'd show people in this it was a it was a sex trade show and she'd lift up her her top to show her stretch marks because she has two kids and she'd pull her thing on a short bum that says yeah, see this like i'm a real person right huh. so her husband comes in and i said oh hi rick how you doing he says yeah he says i said what you doing? he said well apparently my wife's showing people photographs i haven't seen yet and so i thought i should take a look at them <laughs> <laughs> so she's flashing all these people to, to sell me. But, That's amazing. Uh, she's, she's quite a character. Uh, I want to talk as we we're come around to the end here. I, I'd like to have you back in a few months' time. You got so happen. many stories. I don't know if you'd be willing. If maybe I'd be delighted to. I enjoy these in, in your time flies, your and, and uh, it's it's not that it flies in its fluffy entertainment. It flies and it's like uh, it's intense. It's intense. What a story, what an experience, what insights in yep. uh, niche with so many sub layers and mm -hmm. so many things that are interplaying here and uh, and all that good stuff. But uh, I got to ask you, sure. uh, here's a quote from when I interviewed you in, mm -hmm. in 19. Then I want to get your uh, feedback on BNI. And the reason I want to bring up okay. BNI is because John's a big time BNI player. But here's a quote from uh, from Mark. Uh, charge more than you think you're worth. Yes, that's a, a hallmark of my. Here's the reason why I say that. And, and it, uh, Charles Lewis actually drove that into me back in the 80s. It was one of the first ones I took for it. Is if you charge less than what you think you're worth, mm -hmm. you will spiral down. So what happens mentally is is a is you work on your print and you look at it and you think, oh God, for what they're paying, this is good enough. Right. And out it goes. And then your standards start to drop because mm -hmm. you're 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 feeling that that you're not charging what you should anyway mm -hmm. and and, the, and, the, and of course the fight with that is is you still sometimes feel that you're that you're not worth that's a big and we're as photographers people say, oh you got to suffer for your work you don't and you know never don't charge them especially the women coming up because they usually start off photographing kids and they know what the other mothers struggle for and you know there's no lawyer there's no mechanic that's gonna say oh my god i, I relate to you we're gonna drop your mechanic bill by 50 percent Nobody mm -hmm. else does that except photographers. No. <laughs> but here's what happens when you charge more than you think you're worth. You're scared shitless, excuse for language here. Yeah. But you really think you're a fraud because you're charging more than you think you're worth. Right. So now you over deliver because you don't want anyone to catch you and that you're right. not delivering, right? Yeah. Now, even when you overcharge from what you think you're worth, you're still probably char undercharging what you do. Now, there's a concept I got out of when I was working with a strategic coach that is really important to understand this and this is sort of like this phase two of that concept is there's a strata and it doesn't matter where you are in the strata this these components exist at all levels okay so at at the bottom part of the strata there's people who will say you're charging too much money you're a thief what the hell who do you think you are mm -hmm. and their goal and they've learned how to do this very very well is to get you to give them the better product for less money the other one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then there's a raft of people, and they're the one that really impresses me because they're skilled at this. This is they do this to everybody. There's a group of people who recognize that you are a find that you're that you you're charging more than they can almost afford. They don't begrudge it, and they want it, and they will sacrifice for it. And we have layaway plans for them, and they mm -hmm. really appreciate it. And they love your work. Oh. The next one is the most common group. They're the people that think you're charging just the right amount of money, and then the next group are the people who are figure you're a find 
they know you're not charging enough and they're going to take advantage of it in a nice way. Just, just they found yeah. an artist and, and there's a, you know, they know that you're going to get better, but right now you're a deal. Yeah. You're giving more quality than they want. Then there's a group above them and they look at your price and they go, huh, you're not charging enough, which means you can't deliver something. Yeah. I don't know what it is yet. And I won't be in the middle of it. I'll discover that there's some service, some quality, some level uh -huh. that you're not giving. And that's why, because if you were, you'd have to charge more. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what now, if you're charging 50 bucks an eight by 10, those four people, five people still exist. If you're uh -huh. charging a thousand dollars for an eight by 10, those people still exist. Uh huh. It doesn't matter where you are. You're going to have people who say you're a ripoff. You're charging too much money. Come uh -huh. to your senses. Yeah. Give me a break. Uh -huh. People say, oh my God, you're so good. I love you. Can we do a layaway plan? People say you're charging just the right amount of money. Here we go. I'm happy. People yeah. say, oh, you're a find. This is cool. I'm going to, I'm going to ride this for until I can't afford it anymore. And then as you yeah. go up the scale, those faces change. And also the person at the bottom, the ones that are, that are really making you feel bad. As you go up the scale, they disappear. Yeah. They okay. Become, yeah. I, it reminds me I, of Peter Hurley. I don't know if you know who Peter Hurley yeah, is. Yeah, I do. Yeah. And he even said that when he was first starting out, his friend mm -hmm. sent a client his way and said, they're going to be calling you. And he gave him a quote. He didn't hear back from him. He went to his client and said, uh, or his friend, he said, yeah, I never heard back from him. He goes, yeah, you lost a job. You, you messed it up. He goes, what do you mean? He goes, well, you charge too little. And they thought mm -hmm. there was something wrong with your work. So they went with somebody yeah. else. Yeah. I had that slapped my face one time. I had a client came in and, and that day, I think he was, this is back early nineties. He wrote it. He was, what he'd ordered. He had, um, God, there was so cute. He had five wall. No, he had, no, he, sorry. So he had 35 wall prints and an out al four albums. I think there's like a, he pretty much buy everything that we had. And one of the yeah. wall prints was like, I think it was um, 120 inches long. It was just huge. His wife goes, where are we going to hang these? He says, hon, we've got five houses. I'll find walls. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a policy at one point that if you spend over a certain amount of money, I would, I'd give you like 10% off. At the time, there's so, you know, there, there's a whole theory that you should be, you know, encourage people to spend more. Uh -huh. um, so I told him this. I was being true to my roots, right? I made this promise. And he stopped cold. And he said, okay. So he was writing this check. He said, okay, so price of your goods is this, but you're giving me this break for a reason I don't understand. Okay. And I realized that when I gave him that break, right. he got suspicious. Uh huh. What does this mean? Does this mean I just gave a release? Does this mean that something's not quality's gonna be dropped? Like, what are you doing this for? Like, mm -hmm. like this is a big amount of money oh. because of the size of the check was really huge. And the good thing was the little acetone is that a friend in real estate Oh, he's in mortgages, money. And I went upstairs. I was so excited. And I put the check down because he paid for the whole thing in full. And then I, I, I went back downstairs. And my friend was waiting for, to go up to, to lunch with me. He looked at this check and goes, so like, is that is that serious, that money? And Jen says, yeah. Do you get a lot of those? Yeah, they were quite common, says Jan, lying through her teeth at that time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he just was kind of blown away for it. But yeah, so that's my the two-part theory on that is yeah. that, you, that those people will exist um people who will think you're not charging enough and and they don't say anything they just they just walk away they just oh that's uh, nice and you'll never know you you it will not usually click in your back of your brain they just lost somebody who would probably pay twi twice the amount of money so I gotta, by charging more than you're worth you're scared and you deliver so what you make sure your stuff's pristine this is so stratospherically in a different realm compared to the what's going on in the industry today with the mm -hmm. shoot burners and all them yeah um it's a different universe i mean really we have a, a price structure um that i was always struggling people had packages and so on and i always found that cumbersome and then just recently i look at them and i'd oh we should do that i said no i back away and then just recently i've discovered there's a new shift in the industry of people saying well you just just charge per print and i go this is what i always do like we have our price list here well, if you can see that up close mm -hmm. okay so every five prints there is a, like a $50 price drop. Right. And so when a client comes in, they just go, we work for the, you have the, 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 the more expensive one at the top, yeah, at the top. Yeah. Okay. So at the, the, no, at the, yeah, at the top. So when they come down, uh, they it gets cheaper as they go down. So they feel they're going down. Yeah. And what they do, they say, here's, I want to buy 24 prints. There's a the price for 24 prints. Right. Okay. Then when you say, well, that's a bit much, let's see what happens. I get 10 prints. 
right they, they know they're going down like they feel that they're, they're just it's all this it's not a yeah. package price where people oh. say okay i'll buy your package and they, i press a little more is really hard and i at one point i think it was lewis somebody told me at one point that said yeah package pricing is for lazy salespeople mm -hmm. who aren't confident with your product that's me <laughs> i'm lazy so um but you're a la carte i've always respected a la carte yeah. when when somebody buys 20 they pay a lower price than what they pay for say the first five does the price of all the prints drop to that no. amount yeah so so the first five are always in my case like 875 dollars for the first right. five and that's my i don't say it's a minimum order it's our initial collection yeah you, you can't okay. buy four okay so the first oh. five some guarantee 175 dollar sale the next five so you can buy you can also buy by the, you know, by two more, but the next five, they're going to be $165 each. Uh -huh. And the next group of five, that group of five is 170. So on my price list, I have the number of prints, yeah. I have our price breaks. They can see we're giving you a break to get more. Cause I'm trying to move them up. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then we have the real number. If you uh -huh. buy 30 prints, this is what's going to cost you. And then we have our averaging. So they can see what it averages out to as you, yeah. as you get down to them. Right. Oh, so you get to one point. Then what happens to move them up a little bit further is for us, uh, we don't differentiate price-wise between digital and print. So if you want to get 10 digital prints, $875. You want to get 10 um, print prints, $875. Yeah. If you get, if you want to get a digital of those, and you got the print, then the digital or the print, whichever one you get, is $35. So I'm just working that way. It's the same. Yeah. We just make it work from it. However, if you get 30 or more photographs, you then get the complete set. Okay. For the same price. So I'm now saving you $1,600. Wow. Okay. So if you shift, so I got people at 24, 25, and suddenly they get both set. And we, we have a, we use sticky albums. We create a, a, a an app. Like yeah. A, and we make two of them. We have an app for, and I, I'm one of their grandfather guys. I was one of the yeah. guys that said, here's your lifetime membership thing. So we created one of the apps we have is what, you know, their nudes and one app will have all their, their tame stuff. So they can show friends and lock keys and so on. Mm -hmm. so they get that for free as well. All and right. then, the, then once oh, they go up beyond that, and I think once you hit 40 prints, it just drops to a flat $120 each. That's amazing. And that includes everything else where they're fully retouched and it's printed. And then for our books, we have containers. So you can get straight prints or you can buy our, our books. And our books will range from, I think, $145 to a thousand, oh. um, thousands. Of, and we just, that's what the prints go into. So you figure out what you want for the prints, figure out what kind of book you want, and you're done. Whatever appeals to you. That's really cool. So let's talk about BNI before we wrap sure. it up. But I, I want to mention real quick, you mentioned strategic coach. That's Dan Sullivan, right? Yes, it is. Yeah, I was yeah. with him when he was just starting, actually. You're still with him? No, no. We stepped into some different groups with him. I should get back to him. It was, uh, I, I, I got squeaked in because he was starting off. And I think he bent a few rules to get me at the time because the guys that were that were in those courses, they were, they were light years above, ahead of me. Well, that yeah. concept I told about the layers, there was yeah. a guy that had yeah. um, tidy something. I think he was a painter, tidy painting or something from the States. He had like a whole bunch of things and, and that solved a problem for him. Again, this whole perspective. So I felt really good. I should have patented for him. But yeah. Dan Sullivan uh, was considered the coach's coach. Yeah. By he is brilliant. I still use the tools with him. I'm still in contact with him. I photographed him actually. We did his, he was neat because we were doing the photo shoot and I, I think you have hired I made to watch me. And we're wrapping up and he says, I think you're doing stuff you're not even aware of as you pose, enlighten me and talk to me. He says, you've moved me along yeah. uh, that no one else has kind of done for that. That's a skill set. Yeah. Amen. That's, that's a thing. Yeah. And it becomes part of your blood. You just, this is just what you do. You just function mm -hmm. this way. I took a monthly mentor back in uh, 2020 for 17 months with Aaron, mm -hmm. Raymond Aaron. And Raymond Aaron always talked of Dan Sullivan. Raymond was a student of Dan's, and that's when I became aware of him. And I have his book in my kitchen right now. It's called uh, Dan Sullivan Question. I highly recommend anybody get it. It's a small yeah. book, pure gold. He's also got one that I'm working with. It's called uh, How to Live to 150 Years Old. And we took a whole workshop on this with him. And it was everybody's got a death date. Like you may not realize it, but in your brain, somewhere there, down there, you've got a, a date that you think you're going to die at. Wow. And he has a in his book, um, and it's a cheap book. It's and it's not that thick. And he explains how to find out what it is, huh. and then how to. Do we want to know. What's that? <laughs> we want to yeah, know. No, so we can actually push it out. So I've I got right. my target right. okay. death say to 152. But anyways, that's uh, he's good, and he has he has a way he approaches time. Everything's very powerful, Dan. Very thoughtful man. 
So you're obviously uh, you're big on uh, taking coaching and having a mentor and, and what have you. So. Yes, uh, yeah, guys like what you do. Um, I mean, you, the I, when I started doing this, there was anybody would come up to teach us. We didn't matter what the discipline was. Wedding photographer is like somebody's teaching lighting. So I started. There's no there's nothing for me. I I would yeah. study Playboy layouts to figure out how they lit the things. Mm -hmm. There's nothing out there, and, and now everybody just when you go for a coach lighting whatever look at their credentials there's so many people who i'm looking at them and they they've been a photographer for for a year year and a half right and, and they're someone, teaching like yeah and suddenly they're teaching the thing and we had, we had one girl that was teaching a, a revolutionary new way to do something i'm looking at going that's not sustainable and she had thousands of people at the bought her courses and then about a year and a half later she burned out and, yeah. she's, and she left photography she was burned out from us and that's that's a bad thing to learn exactly. she so qualifies yeah and so I, like you're, you, know, you deliver a quality product that's, that's got hard earned lessons and, you know, it's just, it's straight stuff. Um, and it's not fluffy flavor of the month pose kind of stuff for a week, weekly built concept that, you know, I've done this for like six months and it seemed to work. Yeah. You know, uh, you, a lot of these people are teaching in five, five years is the, is the, is a critical point. If, if you're still in business after five years, you know something. Okay. Um, you get a coach who has not been a bit has not been in business for uh for five years mm. not that they, they may be brilliant um but mm -hmm. there's a pretty good chance they've not had all the bumps and grinds yeah. to to teach you and they may be setting you up for a fall without meaning to like they're i'm not trying to, to space them at all yep. and but there's gonna be some of them that don't know what they don't know and and they're working on a wrong premise yeah. and they're teaching that like it's gospel and they're charismatic and they do a good job yeah but you know they're not they're not they're giving you a bad premise a, a bad foundation like if you have if you're if you're starting off in photography it's critical you got a good powerful foundation like again going back to the stuff that you teach it's it's solid it's tried and it's true it's bulletproof it's good you get that you will last 5 10 20 years if you have a weak premise by weak the time premise. you get to the point that you you need a strong it's going to collapse on you and you're going to yep. lose your business and you're going to lose your future and it's not a pretty thing and it's easy no. to avoid. Some pretty deep shit. Good advice. Yeah. So all your <laughs> listeners, because I know it's the BS group, right? You're in the right place. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> You've landed on your feet. <laughs> or, or, so I'd love to have you back. Uh, yeah, we usually definitely. have, uh, I usually hit people up every year. Yeah. And, uh, but I think uh, it would be cool to get you back much sooner if you're open to the idea. Yeah, anytime. So, I'm good. Let's close off by talking about BNI, one of many, many marketing strategies that mm -hmm. uh, both guys are into we don't have time anymore to talk about much of them but uh maybe someday we'll get you back sooner than later and talk about some of them let's uh when when i introduced you to john john said oh i noticed you're a fellow bni -er, and then that started this conversation yeah. so yeah. let's uh touch on that you're both in bni let's maybe uh explain that to our uh, sure. listeners i i'm deep in a seven my seven year i think you're in 10 john i'm said. in my 10th yep yeah on my business card i actually have the bni logo it's a subtle thing on my business card. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So That's a good idea. I never thought of that. Yeah, it's. I think it's powerful. But a study has just come out from the PP of A in the states, and they were rating where what what motivates people to buy, where they go from. Sixty-seven percent is from friends, relationships, and referrals. Mm -hmm. And that's what BNI is all about. The yeah. basic thing is that if I get to know your business now, the thing with BNI as well is that if a person's been in BNI for because they vet people pretty well. Yeah. And if a person's been in BNI for more than five to six months and into years, they're pretty solid. They're a good yeah. business person because BNI works in the fact that we do one-to-ones. I get to know your business intimately and deeply. Yeah. And if you somehow get through the, the vetting process and then we discover you're a scumbag, that your yeah. practices are questionable on any, you know, from painting yeah. to photography, they just stop sending you business. Okay. Well, no, and, and that so will it, actually get rid of you because yeah, we want people that are ethical and moral. And our biggest, uh, our motto is givers gain. If I give right. business to this person, person yeah. in my uh, BNI group, they'll want to give business back to me. And and we are, and that's a hallmark for BNI. Yeah. Like that's our golden banner. Yeah. And so if you're trying to find any business, and somebody and somebody mentions they're with BNI, uh, it doesn't say they're cheap. No. It just says that they're dependable and good. That you still yeah. have, have to go and find a price point. But um, that they, because if they screw up, if they don't live up to that model, they're gone. 
Like, there's like no... I'm the president of our chapter and yeah. whenever we get a new member or if mm -hmm. we have somebody renewing, because you have to renew every year. Yeah. You have to make sure you stay up to your ethical standards. If not, we won't yeah. renew you. Interview. And, Six, and I have to actually do an actual code of ethics with you when you come back in. And one of those is that you're going to follow through with your referrals. You're going to do yeah. um, live up to your standards when it comes yeah. to your profession and, and things like that. And so. this is spoken in front of your um, yeah, peers. Your yep. peers. It works like that. Yeah. And one thing is also it should be mentioned is most people think, well, if I go to BNI, they're gonna they're gonna try to it's a big sales pitch to join. And BNI's lifeblood is guests and visitors. Uh -huh. And so someone who we have the phrase, you know, invite without prejudice, which means just you know, don't worry that somebody is has a chair in your thing. You come in and you get to see a sale a sales pitch, a, a skill offering, what they're what they offer, what they bring to the table from yep. anywhere from 25 to 40 people. And you you now have people you can consider to, yep. for your own business, plus the people on the table and the own own guests. But you yeah. can go in there, they really quickly, are you thinking of joining? No, I'm just here as, to see what you're all about. So mm -hmm. the, fall, the guests fall in three categories. I'm, well, I want to join, I don't be nice about, I'm just trying to find a, a chapter that fits. Uh, I don't know what this whole referral thing is and i just want to i just want to expose a bunch of people in my business i have no intention of joining and i won't be back but i do want to tell you what i'm doing that's, okay that's fair john that's yeah. the three people that kind of visit yep and then you get people that are just family and friends that just want to yeah. come in because Before. every visitor potential visitor that comes to us is a potential client for anybody yeah. in that group that's so right. if i brought you in rob mm -hmm. uh you could be looking for a roofer or you could be yeah. looking for this it doesn't mean you're looking for a photographer but there yeah. could be somebody there that you can use or they might be able to use your business if you come as a visitor and it's not just businesses. We've got uh, BNI's got a big push out now to have chapters have a charity in their chapter. Mm -hmm. We have and a so nonprofit. Yeah, we have a nonprofit charity into it, and they're trying to get every, every chapter to have it, which is super super healthy. Yeah, work into it. But we've also got people who are looking for a job. So I had a, a client of mine that was unemployed, and I had him come in. And so he came in. He said, "I I'm a diverse person. Here's the things I can kind of do." Um, within three days, he had a job. Yep. Wow, That's it's a very good. powerful organization, and it's a, it's throughout every country in the world. Uh, Ten thousand chapters throughout the world. Um, How many uh, are in each of your respective groups? We have uh, thirty three members in mine right now. Yeah, we had about thirty five. I think we're seeing about maybe twenty seven now. We're kind of building back up, uh, yeah, and okay. the people are good. To give you an idea of how powerful, we had a tree fall down and my wiped up my power line so badly it, it almost ripped the uh, the power box out of the house. It was really devastating only damage that did and i phoned up the bni guy that does electrical uh he and we had a huge storm in calgary at the time so every lines are down all sorts of the place he had power up that night so i phoned him on sorry tuesday afternoon wednesday he had guys in the morning by seven o'clock wednesday night we had power here uh the church people he called me on friday saying we should be able to take a look at it on monday and we're already up and running but he then says you know this kind of power outage is going to destroy all your equipment within six months all your computer stuff that was turned on are going to be dead or so it'll be damaged because of the surge comes through and it damages the thing. You don't notice it and it slowly falls apart. And you just think, oh, it's old crap. Right. And I'm going, oh, shit, because I got a lot of stuff here. I can work out of my house. So he, um, I said, can you tell the insurance company that? So he done, um, Danny said, yeah. So he explained the pros. They said, you're right. And they replaced $40,000 worth of electronic computers in my studio because of a BNI member. There you <laughs> oh, go. Really? <laughs> yeah, I'm not you know, their 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 electronic guy wouldn't have done it, uh, but you know he's looking after me like he's yep. he he goes at the BNI members go that extra depth. So that was just uh, That's amazing. You you yeah. guys meet once a week or once a month? Once, once a, week. a week. Yeah, yeah. I and think it's only two two uh, weeks we don't meet over the Christmas time. Yeah, exactly. obviously and, you obviously enjoy it, and there's a social aspect to it yeah. too. Definitely. And we're around the world. I mean, I, I connected. Yep. With, I. I had a, a guy from India that we booked business with, myself personally. Um, we have, I mean, so many of the people have businesses that are, like we have a trainer in our group that's got a, an app. So if a visitor logs in from another BNI person or just a visitor logs in, they'll discover that there's stuff happening in those chapters that are, are in regards to where you live, you can use it. You can access it. It's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, it's all over the world. There's uh, about 280,000 members in BNI. And um, it's over, uh, what, uh, 72 countries and 10,000 chapters. Yeah. And to give a proper perspective, it's not just a bunch of guys meeting. They do internationally, I think it's 16 or $17 billion in referrals. Wow. Internationally in that basis. Our own particular chapter, we, we did 
I think we're coming up on a million dollars so far yeah. this year around yeah. that in Good referrals free. to people amongst now, now some members do better than others. Like I'm a yeah. hard, I'm a hard uh, referral because yeah. you know we're we're doing nudes, we're empowerment things, and so it, it's a bit more tricky to do. Yeah. Um, so different trades, and some guys are big tickets, and so they if they get one a year, one every two years, you know they've that's all paid for. So mm -hmm. it depends on what you are. We've you know um, florists, uh, chiro chiropractors, you know they go through people like water because they're a lot of easy referrals, yep. that kind of thing. That's pretty good. Well, there you go. I'll have to check it out. So on that note, I got to go pack the car because we're leaving out of town tomorrow to go to. Yeah. Uh, and I got a Bear. headshot coming out soon. Got to do a Ferry Day event uh, in Barrie, Ontario. So, uh, Mark, this has been a podcast. It was just last thing. I got a podcast called FascinatingWomen.ca. Nice. Awesome. Let's see. They're calm. I'm gonna, uh, is calm. Yeah. That's your, your another website you created. Yeah, that's that's my podcast. So I talk to my clients um, about how, wow. it's like a role model thing. Like what, you know, how did you become who you are? What kind of stuff did you challenge? Did your parents make a difference with you? You know, what's your favorite quote? Uh, what's your big dream? What's your big failures? Those kind of questions. That sounds really cool considering okay. it ties in with your niche. Yeah. And uh, is it all women who have had a session or is it just anyone? All across, it's all across the country. We've got people call up from the States um local people um there's and they've all got some amazing stories there some of them are highly successful highly wealthy people some are are pretty average um there's a lot of trauma stories in there uh, there's a girl that she was she came from a, a marriage that was very very dangerous and what she does now is rescue women in dangerous things so she's got go bags and skullduggery that she she talked about how she always, we act that was so impressive we had her come back for a special episode just on on how to escape, what the uh -huh. steps are for us to escape a dangerous relationship. Cool. I'll check Very that cool. out. Appreciate it. All right. Well, thanks again, Mark. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for your time. John, thanks for being you. No, thank you. Talk again. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, much appreciate. This has been absolutely amazing. Sounds thanks, good. That was useful. Thank you. Take care. See Bye you later. Now.